What's up everyone? So in this video we're going to talk about Ernest Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And this experiment is like the granddaddy of all atomic structure experiments. This experiment was huge. This experiment radically changed the way that we look at atoms. So this here, this is Ernest Rutherford, and interestingly enough, this experiment was actually not carried out by him. This experiment was actually carried out by two gentlemen by the name of Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden. So these guys were working under the direction of Ernest Rutherford, and these guys were the ones who actually carried out the experiment. So right around the turn of the century, so from the late 1800s to early 1900s, there was some pretty groundbreaking work that was being done on atoms. And things really got going with J.J. Thompson's CRT experiment. So up until then, scientists were convinced that the atom was indestructible and indivisible. But J.J. Thompson actually discovered a particle smaller than an atom uh, called the electron, and he also figured out its charge to mass ratio. And then shortly after his experiment was Robert Millikan's oil drop experiment, which determined the exact charge of an electron, or the elementary charge, and it also determined the mass of an electron as well. So I have, I actually have a video for each of these two experiments, so if you'd like to learn a little bit more about them, um, you know, feel free to check those videos out. But even in the midst of all of this data on electrons, there was still a lot of things that needed to be cleared up. There were still a lot of remaining questions. And one of those questions, uh, one of those big questions was, what about the positive charge? We know we have these electric, uh, these negatively charged electrons, and we know that atoms themselves are electrically neutral. So where does the positive charge come from, and how does that fit in with those electrons to give us our electrically neutral atoms? So in other words, what we're trying to figure out is, what is the structure of the atom? So this is a basic diagram of the apparatus that was used by Geiger and Marsden. And it consists of three main parts. So this first part here is the source. So this source actually pumps out what are called alpha particles, which are these uh, really heavy, really positively charged um, subatomic particles. So by this time, three different types of radioactivity had been discovered. There were alpha particles, there were beta particles, and there were gamma rays. And the alpha particles were actually the most positively charged and by far the most, the, the most massive out of all of these three particles. So basically what you have is a source, like I said, it pumps out these alpha particles and it shoots them into this piece of gold foil. And then the third part is a detector, which is placed around, it surrounds the gold foil and it allows you to pick up the signal on where the alpha particles end up. So basically in a nutshell, this whole experiment was basically an attempt to confirm the existing most widely accepted model of the atom, which was J.J. Thompson's plum pudding model. So in the plum pudding model, you have the spherical pudding of positive charge into which these plum-like negatively charged electrons are dispersed. And he hypothesized that if the plum pudding model was indeed correct, then the alpha particles should pass straight through the gold foil. And if there's any deflection, it should only be by a couple of degrees at the most. So what they did was they carried out this experiment and they found that most of the alpha particles did indeed pass through the foil but some of them actually bounced off at these wider than expected angles, and a few of them actually bounced backwards. So these results were very difficult to reconcile. Um, Ernest Rutherford was actually quoted himself uh, saying that it was about as believable as if you had fired a 15 inch shell into a piece of tissue paper and then that shell comes back and hits you. So again, very difficult to reconcile. Plum pudding model, obviously not cutting it, and we need a new model. So they developed what was called the Rutherford model. And in the Rutherford, in the Rutherford model, you have this very small by volume region in the center of the atom that contains almost all of the mass and all of the positive charge. And then around that, you have basically what's this, this just this empty space in which these nearly massless electrons are, uh, are suspended. So this Rutherford model gave birth to what is now called nuclear theory. And it was first, you know, published by Rutherford and, uh, the, you know, there's, there's stuff that gets added to it all the time, but he was pretty, he was pretty spot on, you know, when he first proposed this. And he said that basically what you have is a nucleus, right? You have this small central region that has most of an atom's mass. And when I say most, I'm talking about over 99.9% .9 of an atom's mass. Electrons are nearly massless. And it also has all of an atom's positive charge. And Rutherford took it a step further and said that the nucleus is composed itself of subatomic particles, which he called protons. 
So we have a nucleus that has most of the mass, all of the positive charge, and it's composed of protons. And then in addition to the nucleus, we have an electron cloud. And the electron cloud has most of an atom's volume. Now when I say most of the volume, I'm talking about a ratio of 10 to the 14 to 1. So that means that the electron cloud is 100 trillion times larger by volume than the nucleus. So that's huge. And the electron cloud also has all of an atom's negative charge. So these facts sort of bring about, you know, some, some pretty interesting ideas that are not very intuitive. And one of those is that atoms are mostly empty space. So if you look at your lamp, your desk, your computer, a pen, all of this stuff is mostly empty space. There's very little matter actually there. And it also brings to light the fact that nuclei are really, really heavy. So, and this is why nuclear reactions are so powerful, is because you're slamming these really heavy, really dense nuclei into one another. When you talk about chemical reactions, you're talking about these nearly massless electrons reacting, and that can produce a lot of energy as well. But nuclei are much heavier than electrons, and when you slam them into, an, into one another, you give off a ton of energy. So that's, that's basically the, the basis for why nuclear reactions are so uh, violent. And it, the interesting fact about this is that if you were to stack nuclei on top of one another, in, in other words, if there was no empty space for those electrons and nuclei were just packed as tightly as possible, that kind of matter would be incredibly dense. In fact, one grain of sand would weigh like 5 million kilograms. I mean, it's nuts. Uh, and and, and uh, there are astronomers that actually believe that there is matter um, in the universe that, like, that is like this, and they call them neutron stars. That's one of, that's one of them. So nuclei are extremely heavy, but the fact that atoms are mostly empty space just sort of brings about the, the question, like, why don't objects fall into one another? You know, like, why can I take this pen and this pen and hit them together, and I can't, I can't pass this pen through this pen? It, you get a solid tap. Why is that if they're both just mostly empty space? And the reason why this is is because if you consider, like, this, this picture here, this is a jungle gym, you know, at some school or something. And I could probably get you to agree that the volume of the jungle gym as a whole is a lot greater than the volume of the bars that, that make up the cage. In other words, this jungle gym is mostly empty space. But I can't really just drive a car straight through it because even though those, those bars are very small by volume compared to the volume of the whole thing, they, they're still joined together in a very rigid fashion. They're still joined together in a cage. So that's why the pens don't just go through one another is because they're basically just rigid cages of nuclei is what they are. But they are, like I said though, they are mostly empty space. So that's crazy stuff. Like I said, not intuitive at all. Um, I, I definitely wouldn't have guessed that before, you know, before studying chemistry. So it's, it's pretty remarkable stuff, I think. So this is, this is all just a manifestation of the, uh, of the Rutherford experiment. And there was actually one problem, one main problem with the Rutherford experiment. And that was, okay, you have a hydrogen atom, right? Uh, it has a nuclear charge of one. That's what the Z stands for. And so we say that it has one proton, okay? Helium has a nuclear charge of two, so it has two protons. But the mass ratio of helium to hydrogen is four to one. So in other words, there must be some additional mass that the helium has uh, in, in other words, the, um, the mass of the atom isn't contributed by just protons. There's also another subatomic particle in there, and these subatomic part particles are called neutrons. So neutri neutrons are actually just a tiny bit heavier than protons, and they are electrically neutral, and they also contribute to the mass of an atom as well. Uh, so I hope you learned a little bit from this, uh, from this presentation, and um, as always, have a good one.